This episode is brought to you by The Quinn Essentials, empowering women with the nine tools to accomplish anything. For information on upcoming workshops in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco, go to thequinnessentials.com. In brain scans, they're showing that refined sugar lights up the brain's dopamine receptors eight times more than cocaine. And what we're seeing now is that sugar is directly connected to over 146 diseases and conditions. We all want to be healthy, not have disease, you know. The journey's different for every single person because, you know, there's so much, it's so complex that navigating it is impossible to do on your own. Hello, and welcome to Sound Mind and Body, a podcast where we interview inspiring people about the many different ways to stay healthy, balanced, and well of mind, body, and spirit in today's crazy world with a dash of woo-woo. I'm your host, Sheila Melody, a certified health and wellness coach, owner of a strength training studio in Los Angeles, and a lifelong seeker of what it takes to live your best balanced life. Today, we are talking about sweet freedom. And by that, I mean freedom from sugar. Our guest is chef, food philosopher, and nutritionist, Sherry Strong, who is the author of Return to Food and the founder of the Sweet Freedom Project. Having been a full-on sugar addict and twice her present size, Sherry now inspires people to trade the white stuff for the right stuff so they can live their best life. Sherry helps people get sugar-free naturally by doing the inner work that makes eating behaviors a natural shift. As the former Victorian Chair of Nutrition Australia, Melbourne President of Slow Food, curator and co-founder of the World Wellness Program, Sherry has developed coaching methodologies that have attracted elite athletes, CEOs, celebrities, and billionaires who have sought Sherry out for the transformational process she now trains food coaches to apply with their clients. Let's find out why getting off sugar could be the best decision you make for your life and future. Welcome to the podcast, Sherry. Thank you so much for having me, Sheila. I really appreciate it. And you're coming to us from Vancouver, beautiful Vancouver. So tell us a brief backstory of how you changed your life and got into doing what you do now. I think at at the root of changing my life, people like to think of, did you have some dramatic thing happen to you, some dramatic story? And I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't start out that way anyway. I was twice my size. So I I like to joke and say I I wasn't 10 foot four. I haven't had a massive height reduction. (laughs) So I was eating a lot and I was sad and I was upset and I had lots of trauma from my childhood and um, my teen years that I I didn't actually heal properly and I ate to stuff down the discomfort of that and my own inability to deal and manage with my emotions. And so it wasn't just one thing, but it was that low level of discomfort of living in a body I knew that I wasn't meant to be living in, that I actually thought I had an amazing body, even though I was obese. Mm -hmm. I thought I had amazing body because I was like, man, look at what I can actually do to my body and it still works. It's incredible. (laughs) Wow. Right. But I also knew that um, I was pushing the boundaries of nature and something's got to give if I kept up, you know, that kind of behavior and way of being. So it was a slow process over the years of, um, I was a chef. I felt I had professional license to eat whatever I wanted. Mm. Um, Then I became a nutritionist and I felt this responsibility to eat well, but I couldn't figure out, even though I knew what I was meant to be eating and I knew what I wasn't meant to be eating, I was still eating what I wasn't meant to be eating. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, uncontrollably. And so I went on a path to not only discover like, why am I eating stuff that I know is not good for me? But to to also understand how we're meant to eat as the human species. Because what I discovered when I was in those positions of influence and consulting to government on nutrition is that even the professionals are extremely confused. Wow. And so I thought, if the professionals are really confused, and I'm confused, and I've been studying this for then 10 years, um, how does the everyday normal person who it's not their job or their area of expertise navigate this space? And so I went on a journey to actually figure it out 
And in the process, I actually developed philosophies and ways of actually understanding how we're meant to eat as the human species. And I branded myself as a food philosopher because the philosophies really do work on a level that the reductionist mentality of you know, taking things down to macro and micronutrients doesn't necessarily do for us. Like I said, um, yeah. not like my Angelo said, when you know better, you do better. When it comes to food, it's not necessarily the case. That is so true because I, as I mentioned in my intro, I am the owner of a strength training studio, so fitness studio for the past six years. And I've been, you know, I see clients all the time and you know, pretty much a good percentage of them would like to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And many, uh, almost everyone says, well, I know, I know what to do. I know what to do, you yeah. know, and very few people say, please help me. <laughs> you know, right. like the, you right. have to convince yes. them that, hey, w let's, let's do this together. Even though I'm an instructor and I'm a person that's, you know, I have my own struggles with food, losing that yeah. five or 10 pounds and not exercising when I should. So that is such an important point to make. And I'm really glad that you brought that up because then it makes people feel like, you know, hey, we're all in this together. Yes. That's so important to know that is like, I just spoke at a university that um, to psychology students who are studying addiction. And um, one of the girls at the very end, you know, she said, you know, I'm a binge eater, you know, and I, you know, I've been looking at this for a long time and, you know, just I'm worried that it's going to be 20 years down the track and I'm still dealing with it and, you know, and shamed and embarrassed by it. And I said, well, the journey is different for every single person because how we're triggered to eat, how we're conditioned to eat, our own microbiome determines what we eat, like our past history, our, you know, there's so much, it's so complex that navigating it um, is impossible to do on your own. We all want to live good live well, be healthy, not have disease, you know, we're all in this together. So I'm, I'm glad you, you said that. And I think too, that some people don't have a compelling reason mm. to look, to seek help. You know, like if you're doing okay and yeah, you could lose a little bit of weight, but you're fine and you're happy and healthy in other areas of your life. Cause there's, you know, the work and the relationships and, you know, your personal relationship to yourself and things like that. And if everything's okay, then sometimes you're not compelled to make a big change. Yes. Now. Yeah. And, you know, I, I run an eight week program. I, I have a bunch of other ones, but in the eight week program, I don't have people give up sugar until week five oh. because we get people prepared to give up sugar so that they're not, um, doing these horrible kind of detoxes. But one of the big things we work on is people's why. And mm -hmm. having an arsenal of whys, because okay. some of our whys are superficial. They work great. You know, I want to look good in my bathing suit kind of thing. Why? Mm -hmm. um, some of them are a bit deeper, like I want to be around for my kids. But when you're triggered um, or I want to be around to be with my partner and your partner's, you know, ticked you off, you're like, I don't care about you. I'll show you, you know, I'll yeah. get eat whatever we want, right? <laughs> You have to have multi-level yeah. whys that actually you can pull out an arsenal <laughs> when you're triggered. Um, and, and obviously, we teach strategies when you're triggered to how, how to actually deal with it. But um, a why is just so important. That is very interesting. And I love that thought of that, having the arsenal of whys. That is great. And it, it's so it's so true. So how did you come to, let's just talk about sugar, because mm -hmm. it's obviously one of your main things that you talk about getting off of. So how dangerous is sugar? And, you know, like we've read that sugars can be more addictive than cocaine. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Let's talk about well, that. Um, the way that has actually come up is because in brain scans, they're showing that Refined sugar lights up the brain's dopamine receptors eight times more than cocaine. What? Yeah. And so, um, and I've, I've interviewed one of my former students who's a nutritionist, um, was a crack addict uh, uh, before, cocaine addict, sorry, not crack. Um, I can't remember if she did crack, but uh, she found <laughs> it easier to give up cocaine than she found it easier to give up sugar. Oh, my God. And here's why. It's everywhere. It's in everything. Mm -hmm. um, you see, in nature, sugar was controlled. It was in fruit and it was seasonal. 
So it was only available a short period of time and it was delivered with not just, you know, fats and fibers and all those other um, macronutrients, but it was delivered with vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals that protected us against disease. And it had a protective mechanism to stop us from eating too much at once. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know about you, but if you eat too many prunes at once, too many (laughs) berries at once, you spend a lot of time in the smallest room in the house and nature (laughs) says, well, when you're out in nature, you were you were spreading your seeds around the <laughs> right. you know, berry seeds around the world. But <laughs> um, but nature protected us from getting too much and it gave us stronger physiological desires to work harder for it. So nature, it wasn't a problem. And we're even finding now that fruitarians, there's these are people who only eat fruit. They're actually aging faster because they're eating sugar in a way that never would have happened in nature. Where does fruit grow 365 days a year? Right, right. The same fruit, it doesn't, mm-hmm. and we have many forms of vegetation that are much more um, uh, less seasonally affected, you know, and they're lower in sugars and all that. So, those high levels of sugar, even if it's in fruit, will prematurely age us. But the biggest problem is, is that most of the sugar we're eating as a species right now has had all of those macro and micronutrients removed, mm. and it's highly processed. Sometimes it's actually, or many times it's actually um, made from genetically modified plants in the first place. Mm-hmm. But then it goes through this series of process of heat treatment and chemical treatment to remove all the, the macro and micronutrients. So you end up with this pure white substance. And if you think about it, that's how opium sap in its natural state, not addictive or toxic, is turned into heroin. Uh-huh. Coca leaves, not addictive, highly addictive and not toxic, is turned into cocaine. <laughs> and cane sugar, if you've ever chewed on cane, like I was asking my students yesterday, um, how long does it take you to go through an inch of cane? <laughs> and they're <laughs> like, a whole day, right? Yeah. To chew through that, right? <laughs> Whereas you can have like um, eight times eight, 48, 48 inches of cane sugar that's pressed and then processed that goes into a drink that some people can eat or consume in, you know, five minutes. Oh my gosh. So we're having this food that's processed like a drug and lights up the brain's dopamine receptors eight times more than cocaine. And what we're seeing now is that sugar is directly connected to over 146 diseases and conditions, including we know diabetes, Mm. we know heart disease now, even though the sugar industry suppressed that information for about 40, 50 years. Okay. Um, Cancer, cancer's favorite food Mm. is, is sugar. But here's the big one that for me is kind of waking a lot of people up and particularly our age is Alzheimer's. Yes. And so Alzheimer's, the, the sugar connection is, is definite. So there's no kind of, oh, does it or does it not? No, it's definite. Um, And the problem with Alzheimer's right now is unlike the other diseases that we have, it's not reversible that we know of. And there's no known treatment or cure that is actually working. In fact, many of the Alzheimer's drugs are accelerating the Alzheimer's process. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, which is why Bayer apparently um, has stopped stopped, uh, any research into into Alzheimer's because they're Um, yeah, (laughs) it's not working. And so it can actually, we start to develop the symptoms of Alzheimer's 20 to 30 to 40 years after they've developed. So it's really important that we do everything that we can right now, because one in five people, it's not so long in the future, one in five people will have dementia or Alzheimer's, which are both related to, basically, it's a form of brain dysfunction and and atrophy of the brain. Mm -hmm. So what happens with sugar is it creates um, these things called advanced glycation end products. And what what they will do is they will create a sticky substance that um, prevents the sugars, um, you know, and nutrient flow into blood vessels. The other thing that it does is it will make our our blood vessels um, crunchy and stiff as opposed to soft and pliable. Mm -hmm. And the importance of that, if you think about it, is, and the best way to kind of look at it is if you think about a piece of bread um, that's not cooked, you know, the slice of it, it's soft and pliable. But once you toast it, it becomes crunchy and right. immovable. Well, that that crunchy brownness, when you combine um, sugar with a protein or a fat, and in large amounts particularly, um, creates that what uh, Louis Camille Maillard dis, uh, named after himself as the Maillard reaction. So that browning, you know, when we put something on a barbecue with some sauce yeah. on it, anything right. brown. So toast, that browning process, all the things we love, a croissant, you know. <laughs> I know. (laughs) It's AGEs, which age us, which are advanced glycation end products, which make it much harder for nutrients and blood flow and 
everything to kind of flow well. And so what's happening in the brain and there's, it's not just sugar. Don't get me wrong. There's, yeah. there's chemicals, you know, that there's was my all the things, <laughs> yeah, all the things in nature that we're not meant to be doing, you know, like putting chemicals on our hair uh, to color it. So, and you know, um, which permeates the blood brain barrier, you know, and mm-hmm. which is not proven my theory. Why are two thirds of Alzheimer's patients women? What are we doing differently to men? Oh. We're putting all kinds of chemicals on our head, on our nails, you know, on our faces, on our bodies, on our armpits, you know, um, that that men have not done to the same level that women have done. You know, oh, literally from head to toe, we're putting toxic chemicals on our body that they don't just sit on the level. We're not like this, you know, kind of, it's not plastic we're putting it on. <laughs> we're oh, putting it, it onto skin, which is porous, right? Yeah. So uh-huh. it gets into the bloodstream and eventually gets into the brain. And um, yeah, oh we're, we're in a we're in a bit of a state of of concern. Wow! So these AGEs—that's advanced glycation end products. I got to remember that. Um, we're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, I would like to talk about examples of foods that are marketed as healthy but are in fact harming your brain. You've heard me talk about my experience working with the amazing life coach, Andrea Quinn. Andrea facilitates powerful and intelligent women's groups where she teaches her curriculum called The Quinn Essentials, Nine Tools to Accomplish Anything. Andrea's tools empower women to accomplish their goals, follow their dreams, and finish their projects, all while not sacrificing themselves in the process. Yes, you heard it. You can have the life you want without losing yourself along the way. I can personally attest to the effectiveness of Andrea's powerful workshops and credit my success and growth over the last two years to applying the Quinn Essentials. In fact, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast right now if I hadn't made the decision to take Andrea's course in 2016. My life began to change and continues to improve as I apply the nine tools. The good news is registration is now open for these life-altering women's accomplishment weekends in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. Go to thequintessentials.com, register today, and empower your life now. That's thequintessentials.com. Hey, it's Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network and producer of Sound, Mind, and Body. Just the fact that you're listening to the Sound, Mind, and Body podcast tells us that you enjoy consuming your content through your ears. Now, if you're a podcast listener, you're a perfect fit to enjoy audiobooks. So for you, our listeners and official members of Sheila's Woo Woo community, Audible is offering you a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial to check out their awesome service. Give it a shot. You've got nothing to lose. It's absolutely free for 30 days and you get a free audiobook to keep even if you don't continue with the subscription. Support Sound, Mind, and Body by visiting audibletrial.com slash inbound. That's audibletrial.com slash inbound. We'll include a link in the show notes or just click the Audible banner at soundmindbodypodcast.com. On the next episode of Sound, Mind, and Body, we experience the beautiful healing energy of Dharma love. Everything that happens is a reason to be, and everything that happens is actually a vibrational match to a part of ourself. If someone is going through like a hard time right now, maybe like, oh my God, my vibration is so crappy right now. But it's not what it is. You know, like just imagine yourself as a rainbow with different kinds of beautiful shades. It may be that we are awakened on certain shades. On other shades, we're not so awakened. Okay. That's perfect. That's a nice That's analogy. That's perfect. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that the rainbow is crappy. No, not at all. Right. We're just growing, evolving every single day. That's next on Sound Mind and Body. Okay, we are back and talking to Sherry Strong, food philosopher and nutritionist, and the founder of the Sweet Freedom Project. So before we took the break. We were talking about all this, you know, very interesting and very kind of scary information about sugar. So I have read that there are foods that are marketed as healthy, but actually they're harming your brain. So can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, sure. So anything with with sugar in it, you know, and high amounts of sugar, 
will um, create problems and imbalance in the body and these these AGEs, which are advanced glycation end products, um, and and amyloid plaquing within the body, which is that that creating that that tough um, the the stiffness to the blood vessels, which we need to be supple and soft and flowing to have good things flowing into them. So one of the things I'm often asked is, are all sugars bad? And mm-hmm. so sugar in nature is good for the brain when it's delivered in fruit and seasonally in in short bursts, small amounts, and not 100, 365 days a year. Right. So one of the uh, philosophies I teach is the consumption concept and how much would you eat of whatever you're going to eat if you had to source it all yourself in nature? Well, the truth is, even me who studies this for for a living would be eating very differently if I had to go out and source it in nature. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, as someone who, you know, loves, you know, uh, believes and understands exercise, you'd appreciate nothing happens in nature without moving. So right. we, we work off that. And that's the thing about nature is it always keeps us in a slight deficit, even if we're in an area where you grow lots of food, because you work off um, the energy that you would get from sourcing your own food. Uh, yes. So. So what's happening now is, you know, even something like blueberries, which are, you know, um, sub-acid fruit, you know, not high in sugar, um, they're growing them now with more sugars than they ever did. If you, if you go up and walk in the Alps in Germany where blueberries still grow wild, mm-hmm. you'll taste that they're not so sweet. They have oh. tons of flavor, but they're not overly sweet. Right now, when I get blueberries, you know, in the punnets from the store, I just taste sweetness and I don't taste a lot of flavor from blueberries and it's because of how they're growing them. And now we're not even getting them, you know, for those short periods of time, people are putting like up to a cup of blueberries in their smoothie every single day and a banana that they would never get in nature. And not only that, they're putting a banana in their smoothie that has been modified by nature. So has way more sugars in it and has been treated very badly. So I'd, in my book, Return to Food, I have a story, the crazy banana story, where I went up to Queensland, and it's a it's a full on story. I probably need, you know, we don't have time for it today, but the the end of the story is I thought I was allergic to bananas because I would get kind of this cramping and nauseous feeling in my stomach when I would eat them, mm-hmm. but I didn't have a problem with biodynamic bananas or bananas oh. that were completely natural. Hmm. And when I went up to a banana biodynamic farmer in Queensland and asked him you know, why this is the case. He said, well, he used to grow them conventionally. He said, one of the standard practices of there are many, and even organic bananas get dipped in chemicals when they get shipped overseas. Crazy. I know. Let's grow them organically and then dip them in chemicals, you know, when you take them overseas. But he said, one of the standard practices when um, growing bananas is to take the same poison used to kill white ants and put it in a syringe and physically inject it into the stalk of the banana. What? You know, yeah. So I was never allergic to bananas. I was allergic to the things that they were doing to them. And when I had natural ones, I was fine. But in nature, like, you know, traditionally bananas didn't grow 365 days a year. That's a man, you know, a man-made interference. And we certainly wouldn't be getting all these fruits from all over the place in the amounts we're eating them. But on top of that, we're actually getting sugar in almost every single food. So Mm -hmm. yogurts are marketed as healthy, sugar in them, even kombucha which some companies don't even um, have in the ingredient label, label that they add sugar to it, even though if you look at the sugar content, it's in there. Yeah. But because their justification is, is because um, the microbes alter the sugar in the process of fermentation, they right. don't have to put it in the label, which is really nasty. And like some wines for a glass can have, you know, something like a third of the portion is sugar, but some wines are marketed as healthy, right? Um, right. Like yeah. um, stocks, vegetable stocks. You think, oh, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to go vegetarian. I'm going to put vegetable stock or a bone broth into my soup. And mm-hmm. then you find out it has yeast extract, which is monosodium glutamate. And monosodium glutamate has 77 different names. You know, sugar has tons of different names. And so, and it's like, I I bought dried fruit a few years ago and I just assumed from this company Mm -hmm. that it would be good. And I turned the packet around and they added sugar into dried fruit. And I'm like, it's fruit. (laughs) It doesn't need sugar, right? Yeah. And beef jerky. I was at a conference in Phoenix and um, I I bought some beef jerky, you know, for travel food Mm -hmm. at a health food supermarket. And, um, I took one bite of it and spit it out. It was like candy. 
Ugh. 30, 33% of that serve was sugar. Oh my gosh. 33%. So what it does is meat is expensive. Sugar is cheap. If 33% of that is sugar, you're doing two things. You're making a, an expensive product cheaper mm-hmm. and you're making it more addictive. So people will eat more of it. So what the heck can we eat? I feel like, you know, everything yeah. is. Yeah. So, and here's the thing. How did we eat in nature? We, that's what we need to do. We need to understand how we're meant to eat as the human species. Mm-hmm. And once you start to do that, and that's why I take a philosophical approach and understand how we're meant to eat as the human species, understanding how the healthiest cultures live, the longest living cultures, the happiest cultures live. Mm-hmm. And they ate in accordance to nature. And I call this nature's principle. And nature tells us what to eat in the quantities to eat it in by how easily it's obtained in nature. So that which is most abundant, we're meant to have most of. Air water, vegetation. There's a hierarchy of the things we're most life dependent on are the most abundant in nature in the, in the ratio we need them. We can't survive seconds with air. It's everywhere. I've had nutrition students challenge me, go, air's not a nutrient. I was like, what's the definition of a nutrient? That which is required for growth, try and grow something without air. Okay. (laughs) Water is a nutrient, right? And I remember someone on YouTube was, I was talking about um, nature's principle and, and a YouTube commenter. Oh, as soon as she mentioned water and air as nutrients, I totally tuned out. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, you're twice, but try and try and grow something in your body without water and hydration. Um, right. right? Okay. <laughs> so 70% of the planet's water composite wise, 70% of the body's water. Mm. You know, nature has a way of speaking to us. And on the topic of fruits and vegetables, vegetation being our third most abundant source of nutrients on the planet, And this is why even though we can survive in the Arctic on uh, seal blubber, not my dietary choice, (laughs) but but we we stick to the areas where foods grow the best because it's abundance. And we know this as a species and even in real estate, you know, location, 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 right? Look at the human species. That's where we like to congregate, you know, on the globe is where we can grow fruits and vegetables, but fruits and vegetables communicate that we're meant to have more vegetables than fruits by the fact that there's more species of vegetables. Mm -hmm. They're more seasonally available. They're closer to the ground. They're at their most powerful and delicious when they're young, as they age, they tend to become more bitter, fibrous, and have less um, macro and micronutrients, including electromagnetic frequency energy. Oh, wow. So, whereas fruit, like when I would offer to students, I say, if you have to feed yourself in nature and your family, and you only have one seed to start off with, a broccoli seed or an apple seed, what are you going to (laughs) choose? And it just shows you how far we are from nature and living naturally, because a lot of people say the apple seed. I was like, Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to eat for the four years that it takes that plant to actually produce any fruit? <laughs> right. Okay. Right? Got it. Okay. Yes. Whereas broccoli seed, I can I can produce some some vegetation within weeks, if not months. Right. Okay. So, but imagine you have an established broccoli growing in your garden, you know, grow a uh, patch, and you have an apple tree, and the seasons come around, the broccoli is going to produce food first. And even the apple tree, when it grows to maturity, have you ever made a mistake of eating a mature apple off the tree that hasn't ripened? It tastes horrible. It's bitter. It's got this like incredible, disgusting flavor. It's inedible, right? Right, right. It's nature's way of saying, wait, wait, wait. We're not ready yet. Yes. Yes. Eat lots of this on the ground. And then when it's right for the season to prepare you for the winter, this will be ripe. And here's the interesting thing that just blew me away about fruits, because I would often eat apples thinking that I was doing a good thing, but not really enjoying it. Yeah. Right? Have you ever had that experience? So yes. if, you, if you pick a piece of fruit that is mature, and you put it in storage, and you ripen, ripen it with ethylene gases... Here's what doesn't happen that happens on the tree. Most of the nutrients are actually infused into the fruit in the ripening process. So that not just the sweetness is developed, which they can do with ethylene gases, but the phytochemicals, the aroma, flavor, and color compounds are best developed when it's on the tree. And that's why when you Mm -hmm. eat a piece of fruit that is ripened by the sun and naturally through the tree, it starts to give you those, you know, feelings in your mouth that make you want to do that. mm, Ooh, and ah noises, right? Right. And it smells so good. It's just beautiful. I, I picked some, you know, natural oranges at my friend's property, you know, mm-hmm. on the first of the year we were up in Ojai. She has lots of orange trees. We went around and picked all these oranges and it was just, it smelled so good and they were delicious, you mm-hmm. know? 
because mm-hmm. they're they were ripe. They were ready yeah. to pick, and you know it was naturally grown. Yeah. Uh, that that makes so much sense. Now uh, you have a holistic anti diet strategy that you call a holistic anti diet strategy. And so how can people work with you? Do they go to your website? Do you have courses? Do you, how do you, how do people work with you? Uh, yes. So mostly my work right now is through online courses um, and live events. So, um, and yeah, the information and our YouTube videos, that kind of thing. So um, there's lots of touch points and ways people can actually work with us. So we can visit sweetfreedom.ca. That's where you can find your courses. But you have very generously offered our listeners a very special gift. So you want to talk about that? Yeah. So look, if, you, if you're like me, um, and certainly like me when I was in my, you know, where I talk about my, I was having half a liter to a liter of ice cream for breakfast and uh. rebasing donuts for lunch and, you know, um, <laughs> shooting up with, with a cake in the afternoon. Um, the thought of giving up sugar is really daunting. And, and we found that although our program works, there's very few people who are just ready to, to address all the stuff that goes into facing sh- sugar addiction. Um, we have something called the seven day eat less sugar challenge. And mm-hmm. what we do with that challenge is we start to get you ready to give up sugar or even contemplate it. And we do three things specifically. We get you to start to reduce your sugar. So we're not saying give it up. We're getting you to upgrade your sugar choices. You're having more natural versions that have phytochemicals and vitamins and minerals in it. And we're also getting you to nourish yourself. So hydration and get some nutrients into your body so you can get that sense of well-being that most people, because sugar can actually strip nutrients from the body. So even Mm -hmm. if you're having a salad at lunch, if you're having the Coke with it or, you know, the, the ice cream and stuff like that, it can actually be undoing the good that the good you're doing. So we need to work on on a three pronged approach, reduce, upgrade and nourish. And then we move people into hyper nourishment towards the end of that program. Oh yes. You have that term hyper nourishment. So Mm -hmm. what, you know, briefly, what do you mean by that hyper nourishment? Yeah. So when I found when I was working with people as a nutritionist and saying, don't eat this and eat this, people had, you know, a little bit of success, but they'd always go back to what they were doing. When I found that I got them into the kitchen preparing their own food, they had much more success and combined. And then when I started to develop the philosophies and help to get their thinking right, they had even more success. And it wasn't until I included hypernourishment where I started to realize, oh, okay, it's not just about the food, right? It's actually about how we think and feel. And that's driven by us, our mental, emotional, and spiritual input. So it's not just physical, we're four dimensional. And if you look at hyper um, in the mathematical terms, it's more than three and it's Mm -hmm. about adding value. Um, And so I I use the word hyper nourishment to look at nourishing ourselves mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, Mm. but also removing toxicity in each of those quadrants. Because if you're putting in a lot of toxic mental input, you know, watching crime, you know, um, watching (laughs) things that actually lower our self-esteem and our intellect, right? Uh It creates this low level of discomfort within ourselves. And we do that emotionally in the conversations that we have, you know, spiritually, if we're engaging in gossip, we're separated from nature, we have this low level of discomfort. And if we can actually start to remove the toxicity and start to nourish ourselves in those areas, making decisions in the physical of like, okay, I'm going out in nature today. Like when I was Um, twice my size, I actually started exercising first before touching my food because I couldn't give up sugar. Mm -hmm. But what happened is it wasn't so much that I was burning 400 calories at the gym. I wasn't consuming 2000 calories of food that um, made me feel depressed, angry, negative, you know, and sad. Mm -hmm. So I got out in nature that made me feel good. Moving my body made me feel good. Um, Having, you know, positive conversations, listening to more positive input made me feel good. So I wasn't so attached to the sugar that I was using to deal with discomfort. Oh, I really love that. And it makes so much sense to me. I totally get that. And, you know, I often tell people, some of my clients that have come in, you know, let's not worry about, I don't really push people on diet uh, you know, they just come in because uh, I have seen it happen where once they start exercising and taking care of their body, then all of a sudden they they just naturally want to eat better. 
That yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. that. So your <laughs> seven day challenge um, um, leads to leads into that. I'm definitely going to. We'll put a link in our show notes to that, great. and we will promote that. And um, I would highly recommend everybody checking it out. Mm-hmm. So let's get to your questions for the sound mind and body question. Okay. So with all of this, and we know that you're eating well. But what are some other things you do to stay of sound mind and body in your own life? So I think probably the biggest thing for me is really tapping into my arsenal of whys. Um, that's the thing that keeps me going when my kind of, I think my my conditioned way of being for most of my life was convenience, laziness, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. sit in front of the television or now it's the computer screen, that kind of thing is to tapping into my why. And my why, the biggest why for me is is mission-based. And what I find for people, like when I'm working with people on their arsenal of whys, the thing that makes you feel most alive in doing, and how does eating well relate to that? Well, for me, it's getting out, doing things like this, talking to you, getting out, speaking like I did at the university yesterday or, um, you know, speaking at conferences. That's probably my biggest why. And I know that how I eat shows up in my face and my hips and my body and my attitude. And so I know if I eat something, I went out with a girlfriend to a restaurant, her favorite restaurant, which was, you know, a vegetarian taco place. Well, it wasn't my favorite restaurant and there was tons of MSG in the food. And I actually got what I would consider MSG poisoning, Mm -hmm. which to me is like having 20 cups of coffee. Not that I've ever done that. And it's like headache and headachey, but just, it totally messes with my moods and, Mm. and even my decision-making and brain fog, it totally impacts that. And so the next day I actually made some food choices that weren't great. And I'm actually feeling it. That was Friday. I'm still mm. feeling it today, which is yep. Tuesday. Okay, wow. So, it takes, so I, I keep going back to, okay, as much as I love my friend and I want to do the right thing socially, I need to protect myself and go and say, next time, let's go to this place because I know they don't have MSG in the food. <laughs> um, yeah. And, yes. and that's the thing with food. And it's not about not having sweet things in life. It's not about having beautiful, pleasurable things. It's about trying to get them to regulate them to the amounts that I would have in a natural environment as much as I can. I don't do it perfectly. And Mm -hmm. I don't aspire to perfection because I'm one of these people that believes chocolate is God's way of saying he loves us and wants us to be happy. And that I'd (laughs) rather live to 110 with chocolate than 120 without, without chocolate. Right. And I don't know about past lives or future lives for sure. But if there is such a thing, I know I came to this incarnation for the food and I want to enjoy it. So it's about finding the balance of wanting to enjoy my food while still enjoying how I feel tomorrow morning when I wake up. I love that. That is just like gives me a whole new perspective to to live with, you know, from now on. Do you have do you have a a, book, a cookbook by any chance? I have I have a book called Return to Food um that has 50 recipes in it, but it's out of print now. I'm I'm actually looking for a publisher. I I bought my rights back from my publisher and I'm looking for a pub- publisher for that. But we do have the 21 day um sugar-free challenge which has 50 recipes in it as well and that's available online at Sweet Freedom. I think I'll be doing that for sure. <laughs> I need to make a make a change here. Okay, so what is a favorite sound? Um, well, my favorite sound is the absence of sound. It's silence. Quiet is what I crave. Like in nature, I I quite love you know natural sounds of running water. Um, it's it feels like what I like are soft sounds, mm. and what I dislike are hard sounds. That's the best way I can describe it. And quiet is, yeah, my favorite. <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay, a favorite memory? Uh, I think it would probably be sitting on my mom's lap when I was five years old uh, on my birthday. Um, there's a picture of it, and it, it literally, although our faces look very different today, when I was five and she was 25, it, it looked like mini me. And oh. I just remember that love from my mom and the joy. And just, it just, I felt completely free. Oh, that is so sweet. I love the picture of that. Um, Okay, so favorite place? 
Ah, uh, well, <laughs> there's two. Um, one is the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because it's it's the place where I, I I get to be creative. So I get to, you know, use that that right brain and and like, you know, create stuff that also tastes good. Um, and it's not very popular, it's not very holistic, it doesn't sound great, but my bed is <laughs> where I spend more than a third of my life because not only do I sleep there and I sleep well, that's one of my superpowers is sleeping. Um, <laughs> and especially when I eat well. Uh, but I now do some work from bed and I used to feel really guilty about that until I saw a movie where Winston Churchill spent the first part of the morning in bed. And I thought if he can run the country from his <laughs> bed with his whiskey and, you know, all that kind of stuff, I don't have to feel so guilty about doing some of my emails in bed and watching movies in bed. So, I yeah. love that. That is great. It's important. I mean, you do spend so much time there. So it's, it's great that it's one of your favorite places. That's great. All right. Final question. Uh, what's the most woo-woo thing you've ever done? Okay. I've done a lot of woo-woo stuff in my life. So oh. what I would like to know from you, what's your definition of woo-woo? Um, we let the the guests define that. You have mm. to define that for yourself. Okay. Um, well, I've been to psychics. Um, I, I don't go anymore because I, I really don't get how that helps me live a better life. But <laughs> I, I've done that, right? Yeah. Um, I think we're much better internally guided by that voice of intuition and connecting to that and that which is greater through ourselves, uh, greater than ourselves through meditation and prayer. Mm -hmm. So um, I meditate daily. Um, sometimes it's longer than others. And I pray. I, I don't have a religion that I ascribe to. I don't um, believe in a guy with a white beard in the clouds, mm -hmm. but I do believe there's something greater than ourselves and science hasn't proved there isn't. And even if it did, it makes me feel good. So I'll still do it. Okay. Beautiful. So you're doing woo woo every day, your own private, <laughs> your own private woo woo. Totally addicted to woo. Yeah. I mean, I, I define it as something that you feel in yourself as a uh, special out of the ordinary, you know, like, um, it, it's kind of your own private feeling of this is a, like a higher power thing, you know, that's, that's kind of how I define it. You know, it's like something inside that if you lose touch with it, you feel like something's missing. That's what I define it as. Well, you know, um, that whole thing around woo to me, um, is something that I think is often derogatorily referred to stuff that, um, we can't yet prove with science. Right. And that sometimes we have a knowing, like, like you didn't have to tell me any science about refined oils. I knew they were bad. Mm -hmm. Like you don't expose a plant to caustic soda, hydrochloric acid, bleach, petrol, <laughs> remove all the macro and micronutrients and it still be good for you. Like I didn't need to have 25 years of studies to validate and verify that. But if you just use sometimes your intuition and your gut and your intelligence, people will go, oh, that's kind of woo-woo, right? I am completely on the same page with you there. One last question before we let you go. Can people work with you privately? Do you do private consultations? Yeah, I do. Um, and I do totally do that. And they're pricey. And I, one of the students that um, had an eating disorder who wanted to work with me yesterday, she said, oh, you know, I looked at your prices and was like, oh, she's doing all right. Um, <laughs> not a lot of people hire me to do private sessions and I'll explain why. I personally believe that the best work happens in groups. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I make my group work coaching so affordable for everyone. Um, because I actually think that we actually get better work done when we're working in groups than just one-on-one, -on -one. but I will work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is to take my time out of my business to actually work with people. It's not that I think I'm so great or that you can actually get this is the price that I think you're actually going to get out of the session. It's what it actually costs me to say to my whole team, okay, I'm out because of this. Right. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's two things. I will work with you, um, but price is not a barrier because our group work coaching is so reasonable. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Sherry, this has been so interesting, so informative. And I want to thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. And I can't wait to share this with all of our listeners. And I highly encourage everybody to go to your site and um, check out what you have to offer. 
Oh, it's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you for asking great questions and being so present and engaged. It's a real gift. Well, that's it for this episode. So are you taking the seven day eat less sugar challenge? I know I'm going to give it a try. Let us know how it goes. Send us an email or voice memo to soundmindbodypodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. And hey, have you subscribed yet? Well, you can do that on our website under the subscribe tab. It's really easy. And while you're at it, you can join our woo-woo community too. Just enter your email on the homepage and you'll start to receive an email when we release new episodes along with other news and announcements and links and special offers. So go sign up today. And if you like us, we would really appreciate it if you would give us a review on iTunes. Thank you so much to our producer, Tim Edwards, and the Inbound Podcasting Network. And thank you to our guest, Sherry Strong. What's your woo-woo? Let us know. Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or the web. Search for Sound Mind Body Podcast. I'm Sheila Melody. Join us next week as we explore, enlighten, and evolve.